Hello, Battletech fans. Welcome to another episode of the Renegade HPG podcast. This is Travis, and my guest today is Bishop Steiner. Bishop is a prolific artist whose work is often shared on Facebook and on his Patreon page, along with in-depth explorations of the related lore. It's those insightful glimpses into the Battletech universe, along with the entertaining flair of his artwork that inspired me to reach out to Bishop to talk some Battletech today. So on that note, let's dive into our talk. Bishop, uh, thanks for coming onto the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Uh, so I really enjoy kind of the sense of movement that your work engages. And I've talked about this in previous podcasts, you know, with uh, DC Bruins in particular. But uh, I'm curious how you uh, kind of came to settle on where, where to fall with uh, portraying the, the dynacism of, of battle mechs, you know, between, you know, in the range of kind of Gundam to, you know, kind of walking tank, cumbersome walking tank, and, uh, and kind of what, uh, what inspired how you portray that and, uh, and how you convey that in your art. Well, um, I came into Mecha, I mean, in the 80s, like I guess most kids, Voltron, Transformers, uh, Robotech. And honestly, I never clicked with like the Gundam full martial arts super speed style. It just, it never worked for me mentally. Same token, I never fully liked the complete lack of dynamic sometimes you see them portrayed as it's just walking tanks basically right and so that's even been one of the harder parts with some of the uh, newer takes we're doing at cgl with the art where we're using the 3d models because they have limits in what they can be posed which sometimes removes some of the dynamics that you previously did just by hand painting you know you got away with either um skewed perspective or as we sometimes call it liquid metal mm -hmm. you know, right. point and in a way that it technically couldn't but it looked cooler um and so i don't know if it was ever a conscious decision it was just always trying to come up with something that looked exciting to me without being over the top and i think because i came even in before that i was into like comic book stuff and so thinking of like Mecca sometimes hitting poses like from the X Men or mm. Batman or something kind of informed some of how I wanted stuff to be able to look for like. And what what would have been kind of the biggest influence in, in that style? You know, other other artists or you know, you talked about obviously you know kind of Gundam and and the uh, the comic books, but uh, you know, any particular artists or any particular styles that really kind of resonated with you that kind of led to the development of your own. Um. Uh, for the actual dynamics, I would say it still falls back to that Dreadlord Robotech. You know, everyone hates Harmony Gold, but without Robotech, I never would have discovered Battletech, literally. Mm -hmm. And I liked that it and Dubrum was another one, which of course Battletech also drew from, had more of that balance. You know, you had mobility, but you weren't watching mechs break dance. Right. And go crazy on stuff, you know, and some mechs were less dynamic than others. Like you had the Mac 2 monster in Robotech or Macross. It was that giant four cannon. You know, it was basically a, a battleship turret with legs. Mm -hmm. It wasn't dynamic at all. But then you had the Veritex that were extremely mobile and dynamic, but still not as crazy as a Gundam or a Voltron. You know? Those, I think, were a big part. When it comes to artists, um, even though it might be popular, in some circles to crap on the stuff from the 80s and early 90s. Without Dwayne Loose, I would not be doing what I do, period. Because uh, my first mecha game introduction was in 86. I got the Palladium Robotech book okay. that worked from Symbeta and Kevin Long and stuff, and I liked that pretty good. But then the next year, one of my friends who saw me with that introduced me to Battletech. And let me borrow his uh, MechWarrior 1E Battletech Rules of Warfare and Technical Readout 3025. Mm. And getting into that, sure, some of the stuff is draft boardy, but that actually drew me into it. It gave me an aesthetic that was different than the other things I'd seen before. There was that, uh, what do they call it for Star Wars, the lived in feel? Right. To go for. Um, like you look at the Warhammer drawing from TRO 3025. The thighs don't match in angles, for instance, on it. And so it looks like some people say, oh, that's a screw-up. Or maybe it's been rebuilt and they was rebuilt improperly there because of the 300-year-old machine. Who knows what is behind it, you know? Combine that with the stories that came with it. And that book 
for the last 33 years is still fascinating me like no other role-playing publication before or since. Um, then you add in David Dietrich, the artist that did the aerospace fighters in the back and all that. Mm -hmm. A totally different style than loose, but again, it captivated me. It really drew me in just the style, and it was different than what I was seeing with other companies, you know. So those are in Mecca, my bigger influences, then obviously we get into the newer crowd. You, you can't say anything bad about Alex Glacius. His, his Mecca are beyond mech porn, you know, the amount of detail he puts into them. Um, obviously, Anthony Scroggins uh, was one of the ones that helped shape the new look, shall we say, especially in the official CGL. And then we've got uh, uh, Marco. Now, um, Mazzoni, I think his last name is, yep. who had this beautiful blend kind of between Anthony and Alex, where he catches the technical side without quite going as overboard, but he has more of that free flair still also. It's just so much that you're seeing in there now that, and I mean, just, I get blown away by him. And uh, I don't know much about the guy, but I've, have you seen the new uh, Tukayet PDF that was the download that they put out? Like, I did, yeah. Yeah, the uh, the one with the uh, the um, black knight in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. and the, a new for us at least, as far as I know, artist Ben Parker in there who mm -hmm. has beautiful, almost Art Deco style that he did of a crusader with the Timberwolf in it. Yep, I like that more than I like the most technical aspect. If the technical aspect can't capture a story, can't have dynamics and. That's the hard part, because if you look at what a robot actually could do, like when the box set for the clan invasion came out, some people complained that I think it was the Nova on the front looked stiff like a mannequin flying in the air. Technically, what do you think a robot flying through the air would look like? Right. It would look like a stiff mannequin. It wouldn't be dynamic. You look at like, compared to the drawing I did a few years back of the assassin in the superhero pose jumping, you're not going to really see that in an actual war machine going through the air. Right. My only complaint would be the amount of thrust it would take to launch a 30 to 100 ton war machine. It would look like a JATO rocket or something launching off the ground, not these little tiny little, you know, Zippo flames coming off the back. Right, right. And uh, I was thinking about that the other day, just in terms of the, the time scale of it, of, you know, it's like you've got 10 seconds to move, you know, what is it, somewhere between 90 plus meters, you know, and so that's, that's the one that catches me. And I didn't even think about that until maybe a couple of weeks ago, you know, because I was talking with Bruins a lot about uh, kind of mech movement, and we were kind of finding that dynamic between, you know, uh, a, an assault mech and a light mech and kind of how it would move and how to portray that. And I was thinking about jumping, I was like, wait a second. You know, you've got to ignite the jump jets, you got to ascend, you got to get, you got to travel your distance, and you've got to come to a decent landing in 10 seconds. Oh, no. You know, it's and in my head now. I can't unthink that, you know. 7 kph, but how fast does it accelerate to that speed, too? Yeah. And the amount of thrust it takes just to break the gravity bond of a 50-ton mech to lift it. Mm -hmm. That pause, that blur, I mean, look at a rocket launch. Yeah. It isn't. It's on, gone. It's a pause, a short, then it finally gets enough thrust built to launch it. Mm -hmm. And you want to see that with a mech. Now, with a mech, you have the cool advantage. You can have it mid-run while it's doing that, so it's not quite as static looking. Yeah. But, it, you know, those are things that get overlooked, and I try to find the happy medium, because like Ray Arastia a lot of times says when I get overly technical about something, rule of cool. Yeah. You know, we don't want everything to be pure rule of cool. That's what I think hurt a lot of the stuff in the um, 2000s and even the early teens with some of the battle tech stuff. It didn't make any sense, but it was cool. Yeah. You know, I like to try to find that middle place between it where I try to find as logical a reason to do it and then stretch it to be as dynamic as I can without completely breaking the rules, I guess. You know what? So... Yeah, and I think it's, you know, that that mission to capture the imagination with the artwork, you know, and I look back and, you know, I one of my favorites is kind of the Jim Holloway, you know, uh, and Jeff Lovenstein, you know, work from back in the day. And you look at those covers and, you know, if you you look closely, you realize that, you know, there's there's Kerensky on, top, on the front of that Black Widow artwork, but nothing behind her is Battletech and nobody cares, you know, because it is that rule, you know, of very cool. 
you know, for, for those pieces. And so, yeah. And I, I think, you know, I was chatting with that with, uh, with Alex uh, Iglesias when we were chatting in the last podcast, that's kind of that finding that balance between just kind of being that, the technical and having, you know, a sense of atmosphere and imagination, you know, you know, I would definitely kind of, you know, always err toward the latter, you know, and like to see that in a lot, a lot more of the work. And that's why I kind of enjoy some of Alex's work because it does kind of put a lot of emphasis on what's going on around as well as kind of the, the unit itself. And I think consistency in style, with Alex, if he will suddenly start doing a Holloway drawing, mm-hmm. it would be very odd and wouldn't draw me in. Whereas with Holloway, it's cartoony, but that's his style and it works. Yeah. And I think that's one of my also fears is with so much of the industry, not just Battletech, but so much of the industry getting to the, we're doing all the paintings off of 3D models now, <laughs> is at what point do you start losing the character and the flavor of the different artists? And you can even see some of that. Um, some CGL guys might not like me saying it, but you look at the recognition guides. Yeah. There's four or five different artists, all who are great artists when they do their actual stuff, but they're all doing line work on the models. And at a glance, if you didn't see the initials, would you be able to tell who did what? And I think for a technical readout, that's fine but you start getting the art inside a source book, you lose a lot of the flavor that kept people going. It's like what you're talking about. You look at the Holloway and the Labenstein stuff 30 years later, and it still draws your eye and your attention. Yeah. If everything becomes this sterile perfection, will the, our book still capture people's attention 30 years from now? And that's one of my biggest fears with the current state of the industry. And um, that's interesting because it makes me think about, you know, the other evolutionary points. You know, if you look at, let's say, the evolution of, of uh, like green screen and, and, and special effects and you see something like, you know, like the original Star Wars, which was, you know, taking established principles and really pushing them to their limit versus with the prequels, well, Lucas had all this great new technology and things, you know, they look, they, they have a lot of flair in that time because they're new, but they don't hold up over time. Whereas kind of you taking an established system and really pushing its limits, that's what's going to hold up. Because certainly the original trilogy holds up better than the prequel, just terms of the, you know, the quality of, of the, the motion uh, these days. And, and it seems like that's kind of where, you know, Battletech could be. It's like, oh, well, everything is transferring to digital. Everything's these 3D renders and designs. And it's going to take, you know, a decade or so before, you know, we kind of master that and are able to kind of evolve and have the atmosphere combined with kind of all that 3D stuff. Very much so. And that's, you know, some of it's just going to be time. And the digital, that's obviously, you have to go there. It's too convenient, too cheap, too mm-hmm. easy to edit, repair, reuse an asset. There's, there's too many advantages to digital. It's just, do we lose all the flair and character of the traditional art while we're doing it? And like you say, I think we're in that, hopefully, we're just in that birthing pain stretch where it's finding its legs to what the happy medium is. It's really going to take the technology and then maximize it, like you're saying, like uh, (laughs) Attack of the Clones versus as much as they're hated. You look at any of the thing from the sequels visually, and they're tend to be better. Of course, part of the reason it's better is if it could be done practically it was done practically. It wasn't all green screen all the mm-hmm. time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's a lesson for us in art that it's still okay. Sure, I'll digitally edit, but maybe artists can still start and work and get the dynamis- dynamism from starting in a traditional manner and then converting it to the digital medium. Maybe. Yeah. And, and I mean, there's, there's so much that goes into, you know, a real world scene too, that kind of plays into our subconscious instincts and, and, and kind of avoiding that uncanny valley. And it doesn't matter how good and technical you are in the digital sense, you're not going to get all of those things. You know, it's just, uh, you know, you're going to miss something, you're going to overlook it. Um, kind of looking back, looking back at your own, uh, own artwork, you know, are there favorite, any favorite pieces that stand out that you really enjoy that, you know, either you like reflecting back on, or you just really enjoy the creative process of producing them? Um, I can try to throw them up here on the screen while you talk about them if you pick them out. Trying to think. I mean, like, even though it's been redone by uh, Spooky uh, for one of the book covers recently, I still really like the Battle of Dairon. Dairon? Dairon? Never know how to say that from the Shattered Fortress book where the um, Shiro is getting its head shot in by the Gauss rifle from the Republic mech. Mm -hmm. It was the first assignment from CGL that Anthony sent my way, and what I enjoyed is even though I had to 
tweak the composition some, most of the pieces I really like are ones where as soon as I read like the art brief for it, I see the picture in my head what I want to deliver. And if I see that, then it's just the fill in the blanks and get it there. And sure, some things got tweaked, like Timothy's like, mm, fix that leg angle or this, uh, okay, cool, that's fine. But it's something that because I have such a clear vision on it, it really flowed very naturally for me to from start to finish, you know. Um, talking uh, about that, um, talking about that art brief, it might be a good idea just to kind of make sure everyone knows that you do do, you know, you do a lot of freelance, you do a lot of commissions. And so when people are kind of uh, commissioning a piece, you know, what's, you know, from the artist side, what do they need to do to kind of, uh, to provide you with what you need in that brief to kind of give you the, that, that clear picture so you can uh, then turn around the best product? It can kind of go one of two ways, really. If you have a clear idea of what you want, convey that to me. Mm -hmm. Don't wait till I'm halfway done to say, oh, well, I really wanted X, Y, Z done, which completely blows it up. There's almost nothing more frustrating than if you're in something that needs to be communicated or whatnot and not getting that communication because then I'm twiddling my thumbs. Uh, it was an issue I had with a former employer uh, sometimes where it'd be like, well, I'm working on this piece to have this miniature made. I'm waiting to hear back from you. Well, I haven't heard anything from for a week, so now I'm just going to move ahead. Mm -hmm. Then, well, that's not what I want. Well, maybe if you try communicating, I could fix that. The other thing is if you're not in a position to communicate or you don't have a strong idea, you're just, I want a battle master fighting a locust. Then, you know, I'll be like, well, do you want the unseen style, the project mm -hmm. style, the MWO, you know, get, just get the basic feel we want and then get out of the way. You know, let me do what I'm going to do if you don't have a strong image, you know, because if I have an idea, I'm halfway through and you're not giving me any info. And then you decide, oh, well, this isn't what I want. Well, it's like, well, <laughs> you know. So either you got to let me drive or give me some pretty good, you know, uh, Google Maps directions for what you want. Usually, like with the CGL stuff, we get a paragraph art brief. Sometimes it's real simple, makes a lot of sense. Sometimes you're looking at it going, they want me to fit 15 mechs in an 8 by 12 page doing what? <laughs> you know, or you're like, oh, uh, there is connect sometimes between what writers want and what artists can realistically or do well sometimes also. Um, but yeah, I, I most of the time with my customers on the fan art have been really good on just trusting me to steer the car. They'll give me the basics and like if it's a unit designation, oh, I want this to be, you know, the Sky Jaegers versus the first Robinson. Yeah, okay, sure, cool. But try to fit that emblem on. Sometimes it can be hard is um, I have one customer, great guy, don't get me wrong, not knocking him, but I had to explain some of the details to him. It's like, well, can you fit in like this pilot's name on the side of the cockpit? I'm like, you do realize my drawing is this tall, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, and sometimes you can go in once it's on digital and put it in there, but are you going to visually be able to see it unless you blow it up 20 times bigger than a screen? You know? Right. There's, but yeah. <laughs> and, you know, when you're on the Facebook post that you put out, you know, there's a lot of lore that's behind it. And that's kind of certainly what kind of uh, beyond the, the artwork has tied me into kind of, you know, catching a lot of the stuff that you've been producing. And, and a lot of the things that I enjoy about that is just kind of reading those little snippets and background of the mechs. You know, is that, is that kind of retained knowledge that you kind of hold in? Or you kind of, do you have to kind of go back and do a lot of research every time you kind of get either a commission or you just want to put out a post? you know, kind of giving uh, giving a little history to whatever piece that you're presenting? A mix of both. The broad strokes is generally retained knowledge, although I'll sometimes double check to make sure, because I sometimes also work on the fact checking for CGL when I have oh, my yeah. going. So being accurate is somewhat important. It'd be kind of uncool for me to tell Blaine or Philip, hey, you got this wrong, and then in my own posts, just ignore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but most of my fact checking comes down to, okay, what battle happened on this planet when, which model pulse lasers are available here. So I don't want to figure out, I can, okay, this is a Draconis combine mech. So it's a, you know, a 
Diplin series CX25 medium pole or whatever, you know, that stuff. Most of the broad strokes is just from decades of immersing myself in the IP. You know, you have people who are extreme Star Trek fans, people who are extreme X-Men fans, extreme Star Wars. Battletech's always been that IP for me where up until the fan pro era anyhow, I absorb and own every single publication out there. And I can say like, I've read the Warrior Trilogy literally over 50 times since it was put out, you know, stuff like that. Some of the jihad and later stuff I'm not as familiar on, especially uh, the source books because I no longer had a group to play with. And let's face it, reading tech ops just for the sake of reading tech ops isn't the most exciting thing you can really do. Yeah. Um, and I'll be honest, there was even the presentation of some of the stuff during the previous, a few line developers back, I didn't find the way the information was presented as linear and easy to follow, especially during the whole Jihad stuff, like the Jihad player books and things. And so because of that, there are areas like that I don't know near as well as the Fedcom Civil War and before. Right. And I'm moderately familiar with the Dark Age just because I've read all the novels for it, if mm -hmm. nothing. And what's uh what's kind of a uh, what's kind of an under the radar source book or or uh, source material that uh, that you've read that people just don't realize how good it is they don't see it you know everyone knows the warrior trilogy is great you know but uh, you know people don't know that X is great well, you know what is X? Oh man, it really depends on the era. Like you get into the Grognar generation, they'll all pretty much agree that the first edition house books mm. are like. Battletech Bibles, the amount of information in them is so phenomenal, getting into stuff, the Davion Civil Wars and all these other details, the Mad Princes and stuff, that when I they put out the follow-ups, the House Steiner, House uh, Leal stuff, for I think it was 3 e Mech Warrior, yep. they came across more as rule books than anything with lore to be interesting to me. And part of it, they're only covering a 25-year span for yeah. lore. But it just didn't have that same feel for drawing you in. And to me, that's, I'm always going to look at like TRO 3025, 3026 in those house books. Mm -hmm. If you want to really feel the lore of Battletech, maybe even more than the novels, those are well done. And maybe it's because I'm history nerd. I found those easy to read also, whereas sometimes history books are too encyclopedic and boring. Right. Um, but stepping past those, um, even more for me than the Warrior books in the 3025 era, Mercenary Star was one, the first novel I read for Battletech, but it really, to me, gave a really awesome poor Mercenaries view of the universe. Mm -hmm. but, and I think that's something that gets so overlooked. Everyone looks at things. Kill Hounds, Dragoons are from the, you know, uh, broad scale of the Lauren Coleman and the Mike Stackpole novels. And sometimes, like, uh, I think it was Coleman who wrote the novel Double Blind that was Avanti's Angels in the hinterland of uh, Astro Casey, I think it was, and seeing, and again, a small Merc unit operating and how they dealt with stuff, seeing, seeing those other aspects, but source books in particular, trying to think of. And along those lines of what you're saying about the original house books, you know, for me, kind of having read like the first, second succession war, you know, from the last kind of catalyst run, those are, are wonderful books as well. And, and then the like air report 2750, something like that. Those were some, some really cool texts. Because they were so well done, but apparently weren't that well embraced in sales, which is why mm -hmm. reason I think we haven't had the third. I mean, it would also be yeah. probably a, two volume set because third succession war covered such a broader area of much smaller warfare scale but those are definite um those were the first two books i'd say in 20 years that to me captured the feel of the first editions um another one and this one i think i'm a grognard the mech warrior battletech one e mercenaries handbook beautifully done yeah it gave you all the rules for starting your unit but because it also gave you the glimpses of the three sizes, Linden's Company, Wilson's Hussars, and Aerodon and Lighthorse, the unit breakdowns, what they're going through, type of contracts they can expect, it made it real, feel real. Whereas uh, some of the new stuff, like the last Mercenaries book, I think one of the reasons it didn't sell well, it was 
okay, here's a picture, here's a paragraph, and here's your Alpha Strike special abilities. Yeah. I mean, no offense, but. Right. If you're just looking to quickly fill in, yes, for your local uh, game store afternoon demo, great, that's handy. Do I need to have a $40 hardback book or whatever to get this? Or can, I mean, that's the type of stuff, in my opinion, should just be PDF downloads. Yeah. So the big editions, the fancy stuff for things that really are going like the first and second succession or draw the people in, get, you know, have the meat to actually justify the book. Right. And for you personally, what has been kind of your, your contact point for Battletech? You know, has it been the novels? Have you played, do you play a lot of tabletop? Is it video games? Because it always fascinates me how many different kind of ways people are connected to the IP. I started through tabletop. Uh, like I say, I cut seventh grade after lunch with one of my friends and he introduced me to Battletech. We played a quick match and I borrowed all his books after and a couple novels. Uh, from there, for most of the next decade, decade and a half, definitely a lot of tabletop, the novels. Um, I'm trying to think. I think I only vaguely touched the video games. Um, did play the Crescent Hawks Inception or whatever. What was it, 89 ish or so? 90, a whatever. Long time ago. Yeah, yeah. The really horrible SNES Mech Warrior game that was out, mm -hmm. and the Genesis one, which was okay if you're looking for just an arcade shooter. Right. Um, and then there was a big gap on those for me uh, until probably about 2000 because I didn't own a computer or anything myself. And that's when I got into the, uh, had moved to North Carolina and my best friend over there was a big fan of the Mech Warrior 2 series. And so from there, I was able to get him on his computer to buy Mech Warrior 3 and Mech Warrior 4. <laughs> yeah. And really got into those. So yeah, it's about 2004, 2005 when I moved to Ohio and no tabletop groups I could find locally there at all. And now I live in Mexico, so even less chance of a tabletop group. And so since that point, it's been primarily novel video games, MechWarrior Online, MechWarrior 5, the HBS Battletech game, mm -hmm. staying in touch with the rule stuff through the Facebook groups, through working as a subcontractor with CGL. Um, you know, there was a couple years there where I was one of the referees locally for the MechClix games, which I think it's an undeserved bad rap. I actually thought once they started getting that going, I thought it was actually, I'd rather play that than Alpha Strike any day of the week, put it yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. So, but, so today, video games primarily in the novels mm -hmm. and just reading the source books as they come out is my contact. Uh, would love to actually get either a Mega Mac or something set up more if time allowed with people, but between, as we just saw my internet issues here, which aren't going to improve anytime soon. Yeah. Um, you, were, you were mentioning the, you know, your connection with CGL. You know, what was it like, you know, kind of how did you get connected with them in an official capacity and kind of, you know, you know, maybe share a little bit about kind of what your, what your role has been, you know, in the recent development, both with kind of the miniatures, developing the miniatures and, and kind of getting all this new product out for the public. Um, I'd say that probably connection really came from uh, Anthony, honestly is before he was in his position at CGL, we touched base and sometimes uh, butted heads on the MechWarrior Online forums. Like there was a Marauder, designed the Marauder for NWO contest, and he was always pissed that I somehow beat him on it. Oh no. <laughs> Which I still don't get because, while I wasn't a huge fan of his particular design for it, his artwork was still 10 times better than mine. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, okay, whatever. Uh -huh. uh, but, when I was up taking care of family stuff in the U.S., honestly, 2017, Anthony got put, hired on to start doing the, or had been hired on, and we had just started, I guess, uh, a push to get things ready for the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And they were behind deadline for Gen Con for that year for the Shattered uh, Fortress source book. And they were needing artists. And so he was like, just grabbing people. Alan Blackwell, uh, Shiny Pants, was one myself and all that and just, uh, you know, offered an assignment. And that's when I saw the Battle for Dairon piece and I really liked that. Did that and for the longest time that was it. Partly because I wasn't a uh, digital artist. Partly because I was, I guess you could say, working for the enemy, uh, making ends meet, designing 
miniatures for a 3D caster, you know, that could be competition to the game, sort of. Um, so you had things like that, but then the, I guess they really wanted to start getting stuff going for the uh, Kickstarter. And Anthony, had originally, I think I was only going to do the urban mech, because everyone seems to know that I'm somewhat fixated on that. Little, yep, definitely. Little um, and so did that. Uh, I still get a laugh that every time I mention urban mech, everyone goes, Tex should be the pilot. And I'm like, have you actually talked to Tex about urban mechs and how he feels? <laughs> he doesn't really, he's an awesome guy. Just just put it out there. And, and he's also an awesome guy. But, you know, um, <laughs> but so I had that. And then just some opportunities came up just for deadlines were coming up where Anthony threw me a bone to design some other stuff because I don't do digital. I'm not currently able to do stuff clean enough for the line art that's being produced okay. or concept art. You don't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. You're getting the basic ideas. And then someone who does have the digital skills like Alan or Harry or Chris can knock out the finished work, I guess you can put in. So I had an opportunity I've done, I think I did seven designs for the Kickstarter and kind of, being kept around a little bit as the team mascot, a little bit as the guy who, when they have other mech designs that no one else likes, but I do, I sometimes mm -hmm. get that bone thrown my way for, yeah. uh, I'm, you know, Bishop Steiner, patron of the unloved mechs, patron saint that is of unloved mechs. Um, yeah. Well, what are, that's seven of them, all right? So we got the urban mech, what are the other six that you, that, uh, that are yours? Let's see, I'll get the one clan mech out of the way with, just so I don't forget it, crossbow, Omni. Okay. Um, after that, did the Enforcer, the Mercury, Mongoose, Sentinel, and Lancelot. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the Mercury, Mongoose, and uh, and Sentinel Max. The uh, the the are uh, the original. I remember the original for the artwork for the Sentinel always always caught my eye. Though the the it didn't translate in my head as being kind of as egg-like as the miniature kind of portrayed, you know? And so I like the fact that kind of your, your update kind of gets it more uh, sleek, gets away from that, the egg and more kind of what I had originally imagined. And I think it was the uh, TRO 2750, you know, I think was uh, its debut, but, uh, but yeah, the, uh, the Mercury has always been one I really enjoyed. That was a fun one for me. Um, the more flat in face was actually an idea Anthony had from, I think was one of uh, Rudy Valen's short painters mm -hmm. idea, something like that. And he was like, hey, toss that on there. And I really liked how that ended up because it, it broke up the egg effect, like you say, instead of too much roundage. Right. But what I've always loved, whether it was Dana Newton or I forget who the original artist was in TRO 3055, everyone, you know, always craps. Looks like a five year old drew it. And mm -hmm. it's true technique the final product was not executed all that well but i look at those designs and like you were saying with the center uh, sentinel i see an idea an aesthetic that even though it might not have been executed that well the idea underneath is really neat and i see a lot of that in tro 3055 also which is you know why i i like those stuff i liked having an opportunity to do the sentinel the mercury which was one of the only ones i completely exploded. In fact, um, on that one, I gave them, I want to say four, maybe five different basic takes on it. Okay. And done the one that got accepted was actually my most extreme. They're never going to do it because I just <laughs> am on it. Yeah. Like, yeah, the Mercury is a hockey puck. No one likes it. Let's do the extreme one. I'm like, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. And you 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 had mentioned short painter. He 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 does. Uh, you know, my favorite centurion kind of take is is his. And uh, and yeah, I try I've tried to connect with him, reach out to him to see if I could kind of uh, you know um, use that more expansively or just kind of get some original of uh, files for that centurion. But uh, but yeah, he did a lot of cool cool line art back in the day. And you know what uh, you know kind of your perspective on kind of using that. You know what do you think? You know of all the people that have taken different line art approaches, kind of you know you know what do you think about the different styles and the different approaches that people have taken along the way to each of those designs? Uh, well, first off, I mean, I, I love seeing the different stuff, whether it's Bruins more, I don't want to say anime, but animated style. Mm -hmm. Right. 
do it because sometimes people look at it and they take it too seriously. Yeah. That's not the point. His whole concept to me has always been to convey the motion, the action, the emotion and atmosphere. Mm-hmm some Alex Iglesias level of technical perfection. Um, sometimes, like, I really love Rudy's art, especially the, some of the stuff he did specifically for the TROs. Mm-hmm. Uh, his fan stuff, I always loved, but I sometimes felt they were almost a, an aesthetic that wasn't quite Battletech. It was cool, but... Yeah, I agree, yeah. All too slender, too. Mm-hmm. Um, where it's like, man, I'd love to see him do a series of game books or a game universe of his own with his aesthetic, because I really love his battle master, for instance, was really cool, but it was too slender to me to feel like a battle tech battle master. Oh, interesting. I haven't, I haven't found this battle master. I'll have to go look for it. Um, it's almost, I remember it almost has like a welding mask instead of the, uh, exposed cockpit on it. Mm -hmm. Really love his charger also. And, uh, his Jaeger mech was another interesting one, but, um, yeah, I looked at a lot of those, and I totally don't care what style a person has as long as, you know, there's a consistency to it. Like if I was to, supposed to look at Laubenstein and take it as portrait-level serious artwork, that would be a problem because it's generally not his style. You know? yeah. If you take it and look at it and can accept it, it's like, that's why I like Ben Parker's stuff. I think it adds a lot of character. Now, I don't care if they relegate it to just this is a recruitment poster for Comstar or something or whatever. Yeah. It, it works for me. As long as it tells a story, I don't care what style a person has. It's the only thing I want is if it's an actual scene of something, I want to be able to tell the story from the art they do. So if it's stiff, if it's mechanical, it doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. But, yeah, it's it's funny. Every time I see a great piece of art, I you know I, I I snag it and plug it into a card for the custom CCG project I've been working on. And uh, yeah, it's definitely. And the the more dynamic it is, the easier it is to create the text. Uh, assuming it's something other than just a, a mech. Um, yeah. What's a what's a kind of artist out there that so that you really enjoy that so you feel just doesn't get enough attention? You want to kind of you know blast them out there, get their name known. Well, one would definitely be a couple of the guys that are mostly known for their. Um, well, not even always known for their modeling work, but Alan Blackwell, mm-hmm. who's doing most of the 3D models right now at CGL. But his actual artwork is also fantastic. Uh, did, did it with Dale Ida, who's another one of the guys I oh, work with. Yeah, I've seen some of Yep. When he gets a chance to reach out and do his stuff, it's great. Um, and there's other ones that sometimes have been part of the uh, TROs in the past, but maybe for some reason I'm getting your look now. Like I always enjoyed Justin Nelson's artwork in the uh, TR, especially a lot of his aerospace fighter designs. Uh, you know, trying to think. Actually, um, uh, on Evening Art, there's A Geiger 42. Is a guy I really enjoy his artwork, his style on it. Um, and without digging through the Facebook page, it would be hard to pull up a couple of the other ones. But on Facebook International and Classic Facebook, there's been a couple up-and-comers who are just doing hmm, fan art. And some of them in particular started maybe a little rough. But over the last couple of years, you've really seen the evolution of their work and the improvement. And that's what I like to see. And that's what excites me is sometimes you see people and they're are pretty good, but then you look at the work five years before or five years later, and it hasn't evolved at all. And so you're like, well, they've probably hit their ceiling, and it's not quite ready for prime time. Yeah. See, sometimes these guys come up, and maybe they're not ready for prime time yet, but you see that evolution, and you know that with just the right mentorship, and that's a lot of what's helped me even on mine is the mentorship I've gotten from Dwayne Luce, from Anthony Scroggins, uh, out input I've gotten from Alex just on the digital side on here to look at. Uh, oh. Alan Blackwell, again, has given me some good critique and work and stuff. Just uh, conversations, tips and stuff I have from these guys really have done a huge amount for where I'm at. And so I look and see these guys like Geiger and all that and feel that if they got the same break, I'd be impressed to see where they could go with it. Well, kind of pulling back into two different things that you had said along the way, we were talking about CGL, and then you kind of had mentioned earlier about the challenges of, of making 
translating art from the page where you can do a lot of things and, and bring that into the real world. And certainly with, with CGL and the sculpts, you know, kind of what were, were some of the kind of challenges and considerations that you took in terms of taking, you know, the urban mech, you know, the mercury, the sentinel um, from the page to something that actually had to be put into a model? Well, fortunately, there's a couple of things that made that a lot easier than normal. Mm -hmm. um, one, for instance, like, have the work I had done with the Strato Mini stuff in the past, I'd got used to doing uh, orthographic pictures and stuff with it. And though we don't use those at CGL, it helped inform a lot of my thinking when I do opposed to begin with. And then I had to learn, the hardest part for me was learning to do a, a neutral pose, essentially a, a zero perspective pose because my fan art tends to be anything but neutral pose as you know right. uh, and so and even when you look at something in real life it's not zero perspective so doing a picture where both feet are at the exact same plane both shoulders are the exact same plane at no point in real life do you see that now in an orthograph you would because reality you know 42 foot shoulder 42 foot shoulder yeah but me looking at it it's going to look like a 42 foot and a 40 foot shoulder in reality you know just from the human eye point so learning to do that was my hardest part beyond that because so many of them all the modeling guys are also traditional and digital artists to begin with they're used to translating anyways and so that really we had very little issue i mean anthony might disagree because he has more of the direct input on you know modders doing well but once we started getting chris lowry and alan black in particular going and then alan would do his uh, or not alan uh, anthony would do his quality control passes over whatever they're doing yeah uh, it really a pipeline just went smooth on that very well for the most part um hardest part for me after aside from learning to just post stuff better for them was learning to let go and not be so picky about like doing what does the back of this mech look like or this or that the only one i really got to put a lot over pickiness on i think was the uh, urban mech because i knew i was going to burn the place down if it wasn't the way I wanted. <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> well we're talking about the miniature uh, what are your thoughts on the urban mech plushie that's coming out we finally got pictures of that um i reserve my right to not comment <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to see what happens as it goes into future stages. I'm yeah. glad to have something to show finally. Yeah. I don't hate what they are showing. I don't love what they're showing. Is it the direction I would have went with it? Probably not. Um, I'm still hoping because in that same email or Kickstarter update, mm -hmm. they did do other stuff like the Wasp, as Aaron calls it, aka Roy Fokker's Veritech Fighter plushie yeah. was there which was the hard edge and my concern is it looks like they're focusing on doing this one as a soft edge where i think most of the complaints that they have that people have voiced on it would be fixed if they simply went with the hard edge and gave it a little more definition yeah yeah i'm not a huge fan of the, the paint scheme either i was just you know hoping for just kind of like straight out you know mech that you'd see on the ground i don't know about the pirate paint scheme that didn't uh, that didn't capture capture yeah. my interest but uh that like I, I get the point hey we can do funny busted antenna because it's a bandit mech blah blah but mm -hmm. even does it is that even a mech that pirates generally even use because yeah, yeah. <laughs> not. the ph doesn't really fit what they need to do in lack of hands yeah you know it's steel stuff with an auto cannon barrel right <laughs> And, so, a, and a stumpy small laser, you know, <laughs> so whatever it may be. Do specifically emblems, you know, give it a somewhat generic Liao thing because they're the primary user or something, or better yet, just kind of camouflage it or something. Give it some yeah. city camouflage and put a Velcro spot on it so you could put one of your Battletech patches from the Kickstarter on it to represent your unit. Oh, I like that idea. Yeah, that's fun. That, that's how I would have approached it, but I... uh who knows? It's not made yet. They could still uh, change it, but uh, but yeah, I would say you know this is your first ever you know BattleTech stuffed mech. You know you uh, it's worth it's worth putting a little bit of attention in and listen to the community and make sure you get it right. Yeah, um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. you know this is definitely. So, I agree with you on that. Is you want to do the best, not just kind of throw it out there and go. Well, it was our first attempt. 
Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Not with two and a half million dollars plus unknown amounts of, you know, late backing funding. Um, no reason to do that. Is it their first attempt? Then obviously you hired them because they're professionals at this. Mm -hmm. So let's get something professional out of it. Let's not have a redo of the dice scenario. Right, right. Definitely. Um, so we're on the Urban Mech subject. You are the patron saint of the Urban Mech. You know, here's your platform. Tell the world why the Urban Mech is wonderful. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> Like almost everyone, I actually used to think the Urban Mech was a joke and hated it. Uh, I'll put that out there straight away. And I went decade plus thinking it was a joke. Then, as a joke, I set up a campaign with some players where I forced everyone to use Urban Mechs as part of a police force in the Chaos March. Okay. Uh, in fact, it's the Zishang Constabulary on Hesse. Um, which is what the canine for MWO, Urban Mech, is based off of, actually. Um, my deputy dog design. Um, eventually, those got modified and changed, but what I learned really fast from that campaign is you put four Urban Mechs in an urban environment and send some more BVs worth of stuff into there, they wrecked face, you know? They weren't put out in open field, weren't right. expected a line mech and that's the thing so many people look at everything in battletech and if it's not i'm on a single map acting as a line mech it's not good well ost scout is stupid because it's a scout mech um it's a scout mech let me use yeah, it as a yeah, yeah. You, you don't want to engage you don't want to engage with your with your spider you don't want to engage with your ost scout yeah you want to do is play rock and sock and robot then no it will never be a good design for you yeah um but used the way it's meant to be used, it's surprisingly stinking nasty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and then uh, I also, even from a role playing point of view, it's a super cheap mech for your role playing campaigns that, while it is limited on what you can do realistically, no one is going to do what Word of Blake did and put XL engines and endo steel skeletons into one realistically. That still makes zero sense to me to this day. But swapping weapons and all that stuff super why not you know why wouldn't somebody customize their family urban mech that they've been defending city x with for four generations you know right right i just think they're they're fun they're underrated they're the underdog now i hope people think they actually look cool finally <laughs> but i enjoy it i like the the miniature looks up wonderful it was uh, the first one i did a little review on it was uh, it was a good one <laughs> I like that review, by the way. Thank you for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. I mean, I just, I fought for years, be it, uh, I was primary guy that fought to get it added to Mac Warrior online. I, someone else had put a post out, I guess, in 2012, but that was it. They put one post out. If you look through like 2013 to the time they added it as an April Fool joke and then finally said, okay, if you <laughs> advance in like 48 hours, we'll do it. Yeah. You'll Eight million Bishop Steiner posts promoting it, artwork, <laughs> stuff and all that. Yeah. And, you know, boom. So I finally got that in. Then they got the devs apparently liked it enough uh, when Tina was still there that next thing I know, they're doing my police derby as a hero mech. And then I really pushed Mitch at HPS to kind of represent the urban mech better in the game and whatnot. So it's, it's just my campaign. It's it's a mech that's supposed to be super common, and everyone goes, well, you can't use it as a mercenary mech mobile. No, but why wouldn't it be an op for defense mech in periphery and Capellan worlds and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the most common mechs in that role, so shouldn't we see it represented? Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and you touched on kind of one of the, my favorite things in kind of uh, reading your posts on, on Facebook is uh, it's just kind of bringing people back to the idea that mechs need to be used in the role that they were designed for, you know, and people are just like, oh, this mech is horrible. It's like, well, it's, it's very good at doing what it's supposed to do if you use it. And it's interesting too, you know, uh, you know, with, with the, uh, the custom CCG cards that I've been making of it, you know, for everyone, I tried to do a little research, kind of, so I put a little blurb in it and reading and reading even in the lore and just kind of how a lot of mechs, you know, that are regarded as horrible mechs, you know, something like a Blackjack or a Whitworth, you know, were, were regarded that way because they were used outside of their, 
design specifications, you know, and so and um, people still don't seem to be willing to budge their tactics to the design. Mm -hmm. I always hear people say, Yeah, terrible. Oh man, if you get into a toe to toe fight with the Yermic, it's toast. Mm -hmm. You give me two map sheets, approximately or more, and a lance each. And I put my Jaeger mech 20 hexes back on a hill, and my other three mechs, like a hunchback, some other nasty close fighters, as a screen for it. Mm -hmm. You want to be trying to roll 10s and 12s to hit that Jaeger mech back there, planking at you with its auto cannons. You don't want to worry about that hunchback that needs a six to hit you with its AC 20. Yeah. Yeah. You know? you use it like that, it's good. And people say, oh, well, I'm going to magically flank you with my Jenner. Well, your Jenner has four and a half tons of armor. I have enough firepower on that Jaeger mech to kill your Jenner before it gets close enough to use those medium lasers, probably. Yeah. So if I use it intelligently, it's great. Now, if it does get flanked, it's dead. Just like in real life, if your anti-air or your missile batteries get flanked, you're screwed. That's tactics. That's what, to me, makes it fun when everyone wants everything to be all my mechs are laser boat grasshoppers, and we're going to run to the middle of the map and start kicking and punching. And I don't want lasers because ammo goes boom. I'm like, Wow, that's about as boring as it gets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think another deviation that people take is just uh, is the, the the weight classes and competition uh, composition of what's common out there. You know, it's because you just see everybody. Uh, and this was kind of where I was frustrated with a lot of the lance back as as well, because I was like, well, there's you know, they tell me I got to get one warhammer for every stinger or something that I get. You know, it's like how can I? You know, people need to buy twenty stingers, and that's why like I feel like from the original. From the last, from the first introductory box set, like the locust was the mech that everyone was looking for. It's because everybody needs, you know, ten locusts for their, for their mission. But uh, you know, 30, 30, 25 battle tech, you know, uh, heavy mechs, assault mechs are pretty rare. Percent light, forty percent medium, twenty percent heavy, ten percent assault, and probably half of those assaults are banshees, stalkers, and awesome. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And even though, even where they are. It even made a point at the beginning of the TR-3025, you know, they had the introductory, the weight class pages. Mm -hmm. Not only, you know, everyone thinks when they have the perfect assault mech that it's, you know, the answer to all problems. But one, there's very few assault mechs that were as perfect as their designers thought they were. Two, mm -hmm. the cost of using an assault mech or replacing one if it gets swarmed and dogpiled makes it so you, most people can only afford to use them on planetary assaults and whatnot. You don't just go... Oh, I'm going to scout with my Atlas, despite the parents' the memes. <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's, and then every time you see somebody on, even on the Facebook, Battletech Painting and Customs, great page, right? But almost every company, I'm building my assault battalion. How often do you see someone building a representative unit or a light unit or a medium unit? And yeah. say it drives me a little batty because you don't have an atlas for every stinger. <laughs> you have actually like probably 100,000 to 200,000 stingers for every 10 atlas built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's interesting. There's, uh, you know, not kind of having followed the lore too far, uh, just because limitations of time and whatnot. You know, was there, is there a point in the history where that started to shift, where, where uh, light mechs weren't as, 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 as uh, ubiquitous? Uh, or, or is that does that maintain all the way through Jihad, Dark Age, whatnot as well? Two areas where it shifts largely. You have the height of the Star League, where you would have a more medium heavy force, tactically flexible, because lights are still more scouts and flankers. That's not your primary military force with any unit. Mm -hmm. you know, whereas, and you look even at the U.S. Army or the other First World Nation armies today, the main battle tank and similar units are the spearhead, the primary. And then you have support stuff on either end. You know, your paddled and artillery pieces, the assault mix, so to speak. Or your, you know, uh, IFVs and scout vehicles. But, so during the era of the Star League, it would almost certainly, now I can't say I have random assignment tables that back this up because they leave a lot of that intentionally vague. Yeah. But, the sense is during that time of a peak technology golden age, you're going to be a more medium heavy force. So won't go assault because the big thing other people overlook is assaults are not tactically flexible. Right. 
Right. It's never going to be your primary focus, except potentially maybe some units like in a culture like the clams where everything's about dueling, then tactical flexibility is not really the forethought of the doctrine. Then, but the next time you see a shift in that would be during the clan invasion because they needed more frontline fighting units. And mm -hmm. wasps, while cheap to make, they're going to just get wiped out in droves versus the clan. So while you still are building them, it doesn't make sense. You're going to be building a lot more enforcers and centurions, your line mechs, and other heavy mechs, archers. You know, archers were 100,000 built before the first succession war started. Mm -hmm. you, and you have to figure there's probably a few tens of thousands more built at seven different factories since then. You know, how many are still intact by the clan invasion with, you know, wear, tear in the wars? I don't know. But um, representative-wise, they would have to be possibly the most common heavy mech just by sheer numbers produced. Mm -hmm. And their as fire support generally means they're not going to be running nose to nose like a Thunderbolt will be or other things, you know. Yeah, so they're gonna survive. But then you get back into the jihad, mobility did become more important again after the initial deaths because a lot of times you were trying to hit and run, disengage. You couldn't afford to necessarily slug it out toe to toe. And into the early dark age, anyhow, where a lot of times it was just against industrial mechs and vehicles, again, light and fast medium mechs made a lot more sense in more cases. Now, where it's going with Ill Clan and the um, Shattered Fortress era, I would guess you're seeing some units like the Clan, uh, probably Falcons, Wolves, and the Republic are probably upsizing their forces. Davion and Steiner are lucky to be fielding anything right now with as badly, you know, beat up as they are. If I recall, Merrick is now currently defunct again. And I don't know because of how long their campaigns have been with uh, Curita and Liao, how much they've been able to keep up with bulking up and upsizing their forces. But again, I don't see assaults being a primary focus because again, they're just not flexible. Right. So yeah. that's, that's the Bishop Steiner, um, uh, dummy's guide to mech classes in Battletech. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, for me, when I'm playing, I, you know, it's not super fun to play with assault mechs that are just slowly walking and shooting. You know, I like, I like, you know, trying to flank, trying to uh, pull forces apart. That's my favorite thing when I'm, when I'm playing, you know, is I, I like to try to kind of uh, separate the forces and then have the mobility to basically be able to swarm to one side while they're slowly plotting to try to get their forces back together. So, um, but uh, and you can't do that with the big max. You know, you got to be you got to be medium primarily. The opposition force because that's when somebody says, "Oh, I have my AS seventy Atlas. I have an AC 20 I'm like, "Yes," and you're moving three to five hexes each turn, and you get six hexes to effectively use that AC twenty. Yeah. Plus, you want a minus or a plus six to plus eight to hit penalty, you know, range movement and all that. So I'm like bring it and I'll sit back here with my archers or Jaeger mechs and yeah. take the big butt to death. <laughs> and I can I can walk backwards faster than you can close the distance on me while keeping my, my weapons targeted on you. Definitely. If you want to bring in the seven R S that has a small railroad arm rack and AC ten and two large lasers, now suddenly it just has to keep to medium range to be a threat. And okay, that's that's actually dangerous. Yeah. But I still put these things on the op for because to me it it provides interesting, and even when running campaigns for players in the past, I always find it more interesting to run smaller units with enemy boss mechs, so to speak. Like, the big bad is in an Atlas or a mm -hmm. Awesome or whatnot. Okay, how are you going to deal with it? He has an Awesome and two medium you know, cronies. You guys got you know five or six medium and light mechs. How do you deal with it? Yeah. You know? Well, that's interesting. I mean, you look at that and in, in even the books, or at least the early early books, you know, you got, you know, Hans Davian, you know, Morgan Hossack Davian, those are in the, the Atlas and the Battlemaster and, you know, and then you have, uh, you know, Victor, you know, and his big mechs. But even, even Kai, you know, he's in a Centurion or a Hatchet Man, you know, granted he could have gotten a bigger one if he wanted one, but uh, even like Open of yeah, yeah. Warrior Trilogy, you got Justin piloting a Valkyrie, you know, <laughs> so... Uh, so yeah, it's uh, and he's the, he's the commander of that unit. So, yeah, you've got the commander of the biggest mercenary unit in the inner sphere driving an archer. Yep. 
<laughs> so all all of them are driving archer what do we got we got uh we got wolf we got kel we got snore snort is an archer too right um but uh yeah archer that's because there's lots of them right later which i get it's a starling mech but when you look at the fact it has no ammo and no backup weapons i, I question him trading his archer for a bombardier but <laughs> Fluff is fluff. <laughs> yeah, that's what you gotta do. Well, let's talk about another another mech that you love. Tell tell us about the assassin, because I also happen to love the assassin. I love how it looks. You know, I, I don't get it on the tabletop that much, um, but uh, that is that is a cool looking mech. You know, especially with Luce's Luce's original artwork there. It's another mech I underestimated. I did love his artwork for it because of that slightly janky proportions and mm -hmm. like your ex arms. For some reason, I just thought, hey. It bores me when every mech has the same proportions, and that's yeah. I've been fighting. I won't say fighting, but it's an it's my stance when I debate design choices with Anthony. Is I don't want everything to look samey. I I want an Ostol to have long legs and stumpy arm because yeah. that's aesthetic. In the assassin, also, um, it was another one though that when it came to actual use, I bought the miniature because I thought it looked really cool because of those proportions. The original ones, I don't like the current IWM one because they emphasize the wrong areas of the cockpit really badly. Um, and I can officially say the front is the official cockpit. Just want to put that there, not the top. Um, but it was, again, a, a scenario only this time. I didn't spring it on my players. I was doing a Solaire 7 with the box set match with a friend. And we were doing random Mech Warrior 2 characters. So I'm like, I usually pick medium because it gave you better skill capabilities in Mech Warrior 2 because you had the priority list like one, two, three, four, you know, skills four, attributes three, Mech 2. If you picked an assault mech, then your skills would be lower, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I like picking medium mechs because it gave you a, a good amount for attributes and skills still. And I'm like, all right, let's see what happens. I mean, I've been running some Cheerians and stuff for years, I love them. And I roll for Solaris 7 an assassin on the random assignment chart. I'm like, I'm so screwed. <laughs> this probably isn't going to go well. And I end up, my opponent is in a Griffin, and we're on the Davion Stadium, which the map for it was a, a Tundra. But even though it was that holographic stadium, the actual map came with this wide open, like, ice crevasse and everything. And so the only thing I could think to do was I loaded, because this was back in the day still where only SRM2s and streak SRM2s could use Infernos. Yep. Well, they changed the rules, what, around 2000 or something. But, so I'm like, well, I'm going to, even though it's a cold map, I'm going to slap some Infernos in there, and I guess I'm going to just max out my mobility and see what happens. So I'm running around 11 hexes, jumping seven, just tossing my LRM5 every round at this darn Griffin. And I'm managing to keep it where, like, he has to roll 12 or 13 even to hit me. And obviously, if it's 13, they can't do it, period, by the rules. So I'm like, how's this? And slowly, maybe every second or third LRM ball, I'm doing, like, three damage, three damage, three damage, you know, chipping away. And after, like, 25, 26 rounds of that, <laughs> running out of ammo, so I start running forward, and I start firing my Infernos at him, too. And this guy has already got pissed off enough that he's firing his PPCs and his LRMs at me until he's yeah. basically out of ammo. with the Griffin now. <laughs> and uh, so I finally nailed him with a couple Inferno rounds and started just jumping around him, you know, pew, pew, with my medium, one medium laser, then jump over, pew, pew. And every third round, I'd fire another SRM2 uh, Inferno round at the guy and just keep it so he couldn't hit me. And eventually, he blew my medium laser off, so I'm like, screw it. And I basically do a death from above and end up putting a foot through his cockpit. <laughs> so 38 or 40 rounds later, <laughs> but that's what kind of put that light off in my head. Wait a sec. Play to your strengths, not to what the other guy wants you to do. Yeah. It can work. And so I started looking at that, but and that started my not love, but my not hating it. But around, when I said 2000, is when I think I got the Mech Warrior 2 Mercenaries game. And one of the early chassis you can afford is an Assassin. And I started ripping out the SRM2 for a second LRM5 early on. And I learned really quick, like, especially on the, there's this one mission where you're assaulting a city and there's a couple stalkers that come out after you. That if I kept backpedaling, 
they continuously walk into my LRM range, whereas I kept falling out of their range from where they'd launch. And the LRMs and MechWarrior 2 seem to have a real bad habit of hitting cockpits. Um, so there, I just basically moonwalked that assassin, firing my two LRM 5s for all I was worth. And it's like, bam, one stalker dead. Bam, another stalker dead. And it just, that, and that's actually been my custom variant ever since, is two LRM 5, one medium laser, because you a much more flexible harasser form of the Valkyrie. Valkyrie is a neat little mech, but it's kind of slow for a light. Yeah, and you're setting eleven seven and tossing ten LRMs around the map. That that lets you cause some havoc, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the reasons I love the the Jenner too, just because it is so so fast and mobile. Though it's only got five jump jets, but yeah, the assassin those seven jump jets does, and the the spider with eight. You know, I I had a I had an awesome experience uh, playing tabletop where I was doing intel in a canyon. And uh, and we purposely my my uh, my lance was was vastly overclassed in battle value because he was the defender and I was just coming in and uh, and yeah I just had had a couple of mechs and then I had a spider and the spider just I I just tried to pull his guys to one side of the board spider quickly moved to the other and uh, you know they had he had a catapult just like with him in his sights and he could not hit it and jumping eight every turn eight every turn every turn and then he brought in another mech I forgot what his backup was two mechs he still couldn't catch it and then i was able to just get out of there without ever taking a shot you know because it's a spider if he took one shot he's gone yeah. <laughs> but yeah. uh but yeah well you're jumping eight hexes every every turn it's hard to hit yeah but yeah that's long enough with the spider is if you want to use your two medium lasers you can't really afford to jump yeah that, yeah that's the only knock on it but like you said when you're using it just to harass and Maybe just use even one laser enough, especially if you can get behind someone to just really piss off the other guy to get to fight stupid. Mm -hmm. That's when you know you're about to have fun. And that's even on the HBS when uh, I was still able to do that more often. Uh, one of the other guys I know on there, apparently I got a reputation. People started rage quitting on me on that. And they hated me because I'd have like sensor lock and a uh, Jaeger Mac Alpha with the LRMs and the AC2s. And my basic rule was I'll fall back, sensor lock you, and pummel the crap out of you. And they're like, why don't you play fight like a real man, fight fair? I'm like, I'm in a Jaeger mech. I'm not going to charge your... <laughs> well, that, that's war. <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> if I want to buy my artwork, you probably don't want to play me at tabletop if, because I'm probably going to either make you mad or bore you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can can you imagine kind of an insurgent in Iraq, you know, yelling at the sniper? Why don't you come shoot me with your pistol? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, oh, why would I do that? Let's fight like high noon in the street. <laughs> like that's become the trend, and I don't know when that happened because I never. You, I mean, you'd always have the occasional guy in the day who just wanted anyone to play his way, but it seems like every time I talk to people today. That is norm. Let's play on a single map sheet and everything's, you know, pew, pew, nose to nose. And I'm like, why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when we, in my heyday, I'm a grog lord, but in the heyday, we had, on average, we do at least six map sheets on our big table. And we had what we called rotating maps where we'd have a couple maps set up. And if we ended up moving to the farm, we'd Hello. push yeah. the thing there and slap new maps on. You know? Yeah, I hate that edge of combat. Uh, I don't play like that. I'm like, you know, you can't push someone off a map. You just, you put another map there and you keep going. <laughs> you might have an area that there's a tall enough canyon wall on one side they can't get over. Yeah. Maybe. But how often is that going to be the case? Right, yeah. right. The, the, and I think some of that's also the uh, video game mentality. Just like everyone expects mm -hmm. has unlimited customization at no cost. Yeah. How often see people or talk to people on the pages that they use and hey if that's what they want to do at home more power to you but people are doing customization using the construction rules not the actual customization and modification rules where you got a rule to see if you get that right you could possibly cause damage to the mech it's going to be out for three months and cost you x amount of dollars right or oh yeah i'm going to slap clan endo in my inner sphere <laughs> Okay, so you got a hold of a clan zero G factory, paid them the R and D and prototyping billions of dollars probably to make a one off endosteel skeleton for your mech. 
because no one else makes one. So there isn't some existing model just to cast. There's no STLs to pirate here, you know? Yeah. And it's like, that's where, okay, again, you do that at home, great. It kills me though when people like jump on a conversation about X, Mac, or this, and they start throwing their Munchkin customs. And I'm like, this isn't a conversation about your Munchkin mix. You know, once you start getting into customization to begin with, you kind of throw all comparison capability out of the window because at some point, anything can be made to do anything else. Definitely. Well, people aren't really good at about reading posts when they comment. <laughs> no. Even something as simple, I think I posted an artwork last night. I was trying to find the artist and it was a picture of a thug. And, uh, you know, I, I got the artist, but half the posts were saying, it's a thug. I was like, I know it's a thug. <laughs> I was asking who made the art. And it was like, you got to read. It was only a one sentence post. You can do it. You can, you can pull it out. I but, even put uh, it at times and it's still like, <laughs> you know, okay. But Just, that being, yeah, that being said, and I talked about this with text, you know, the, the community for bottle tech is, is so much more wholesome and, and positive than, than the others that, you know, I, I see, you know, certainly online and Facebook and, and I have a blast with it. There's, there's so much knowledge in there, you know, your post in particular, there's, there's so much I've learned and I, I've gone back to a lot of them, uh, for research when I'm doing my CCG and trying to figure out things. Certainly, uh, you did one that I, that I saved that I always go back to where you were talking about kind of what the, uh, what the house standard mechs were back in 3025. And I'm like, oh, which one, you know, what was the, what was the standard mech for, for Merrick? I don't remember. It's like, oh, Hermes. Okay. Hermes. <laughs> or something. That was a while ago. Cause I think I had a couple of those and people wanted to fight and argue. Well, this mech is built here. Yes. They built it. That doesn't mean it's their standard unit. Yeah. So there, there's that concept where people don't still grasp it's, a house built versus the house standard. Right. But, and some of that's also been fuzzied up by CGL, Fan Pro, and all that over the years too, where there's less emphasis on that, or then they started, I don't know why, calling random mechs. This is a Davion Totem mech. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even, I, I hate the concept of Totem mechs, not, not the original, like, okay, this is the Nova Cat. It's their pride and joy in this flagship. But, oh, here are My Little Pony totem mech. Plans are supposed to be anti-waste, limited resources, and they're going to go to all the effort to make a mech that looks like a horse. Yeah. Do you know how much more it would cost in time and maintenance, even in between fights, just to repair that stylized armor and everything versus a normal war machine? And half the totem mechs are... Standard mechs, battle mechs, not omni mechs. Yeah. You're making your totem mech a mech that's specifically for freebirths in your army who you deride. Where's those are the areas again where even in canon, it's like some of the line developers and writers stop either reading or caring about the concepts that came before. Yeah. The world. And that that bugs me. Things like Pointless retcons. Um, the laser uh, anti-missile system. Some point, I don't even know when, it got retconned to like 3046 as prototype and 3049 in production by Clan Wolf. Yet the first mention ever of a laser anti-missile system is in the Blood of Kerensky series when they're introducing Phelan to Grinner 2.0 and Ron specifically says, we wanted to put a laser anti-missile system in it, but our techs have never got one functional. Now, that's Clan Wolf. They were on Stranomecti, and it was a gift from the con. Yeah. There was a laser anti missile system. He'd know. Yeah. You know, and yet, boom, let's retcon this. Then you retconned it. But why did you have to retcon it so it doesn't make any sense with what came before? Yeah. Well, who knows if that's uh, just an intentional or not caring or simply just a not knowing because, uh, you know, I think people don't understand how few people are working on Battletech. And, uh, and that's a lot of knowledge, you know, unless they have somebody there that can, you know, has that, that ability to kind of pull it up. Somebody like, a, I forgot, I forgot who the name of the Star Wars guy who's kind of their lore guy. Um, but uh, who is it? Dave Filoni, the guy who did the Clone Wars, Rebels and all that knows 
He Dave, like, knows, Dave knows a lot, but there's another guy that is uh, is kind of like their their lore guy, he, and he's active on Twitter with a lot of lore stuff. I'm just blanking on his name. I'm sure it'll pop up as soon as I stop the record button. But uh, but yeah, but you know, it, it's nice to have those people. I've I've asked uh, I asked uh, a lot of the authors in my interviews with them if they you know I know I asked Bob and I asked Mike uh, when I was talking to us like do you, do you have like a lore people that helps you with consistency and they're like no we just we just gotta do the research ourselves and you know figure it out and hopefully as people are reading drafts and edits that they can catch each other's oversights but uh but yeah i mean you know i it, it's extremely impressive you know it's probably those those 50 read-throughs that you can pull up that quote by that random <laughs> side quote by ulrich uh but uh you know there's a good chance they just didn't remember yeah and sometimes it didn't remember sometimes it didn't fit an agenda like yeah um, if you want to be technical the primitive mechs being built in the job make any sense? No, but if you want to sell the miniatures, you have to have it in the current play era somehow fit in. Yeah. Uh, did the Royal Mechs need to be added to the Star League? Well, they kind of contradict everything in the 2750 TRO and the 3025 TRO. Mm -hmm. So not really, but hey, we wanted to have an opportunity to put out more minis, more designs, more source material. Because yeah. again, we also stopped making product you stop making money, your doors close. Yeah. So there is that balance too. And it's just when it's blatant where you're scratching your head that I'm going to just start pounding my head on the keyboard. <laughs> and yeah. you're like, this didn't need to oh, boy. It's like I, I got in a fight, not a fight, a misunderstanding when I at one point mentioned how much I hated the Urban Mech Aero 4 variant. And it was designed by some fans for the tabletop game. Which which is cool. That's fine. And then Herb um, canonized it. My complaint wasn't that. It was the way it was canonized would have made more sense. There were so many ways they could have canonized it where it would have still fit making sense as an urban mech. And by making it this Endosteel XL uh, engine monstrosity, it, I mean, most of the word of Blake massive army upsizing made no sense anyhow. But you know, you add that in and you're like, or I could make an urban mech, take out the jump jets, reduce the armor, and just add an arrow four to it because it's not a frontline unit anyhow. Why does it need these other toys? Or even simpler, I could take a Hollander and literally do a one-for-one -one swap with the Gauss rifle for the arrow four and Bob's your uncle. You know, and it's like, oh, but is it the fault of the guys who created the arrow four? No, that was for their tabletop game, and that's... That's fine. It's when they canonize some of the stuff without, again, taking the time to think through, does it really fit this way or can we modify it? Because anything that's done, even if I come up with an idea I love and they're like, hey, we're going to put it in. Like, let's say the Urban Mech Lamb somehow actually becomes canon, God forbid. You know, do what it takes to make it make sense, though. It doesn't have to be word for word what I came up with mm -hmm. if it fit, you know. That's all. Yeah. Although I don't think an urban mech lamb ever would make sense, really. But that's <laughs> maybe it's like you know a giant helicopter type of thing, you know, like a cargo carrier. But yeah, no, it's something dynamic. That would be me at one point. I need yeah. to see the drawing I did of it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, what's uh, what's some what's some stuff that uh, you know that you think CGL is doing right or, or things that have been really good in the past of Battletech that have kind of been lost that you, you know, that you'd like to see them doing more, you know, kind of moving forward now that we're in the Elcon. Um, I mean, there is a lot they have been doing, right? Especially from 2012, 2013 on, mm -hmm. they've been consolidating, really putting a focus to trying to have consistent superior artwork, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, as much as I do love a lot of the stuff that came before, there's a lot of nostalgia. You know, that does not, nostalgia does not bring in new players. New players, modern players want the cool, the, the professional stuff. So we, I like that. Uh, you mentioned the first and second succession war books. Those were fantastic. Even the uh, combat manual, I think it was for Curita, was pretty good, uh, better than the mercenary one. And, you know, there have been a lot of thought and questions going around. And there's stuff I can't touch on, but. Um, there's also been some thought process going in now. Why is it that players love book X from the past so much, but didn't seem to gravitate towards the new one? Mm -hmm. And then trying to find that 
awesome sauce formula again for putting out the new stuff. And uh, I, I was actually thinking about that before our talk today, you know, because I know I know Luce was a was an influence for you and in that and that everyone loves the TRO 3025. And there's not they really haven't followed that model. Like it's just like great line arts, great background, a couple notable mech warriors, and that that's your recipe. And there's like even going to 3025 or 3050 you know, they like left that and you granted they came out back to back. So they do that. But five years down the road, they're like, oh, everyone really likes 3025 later. 35 years down the road, everyone really likes 3025. Maybe we should just take that model. And do it. <laughs> Something kind of can get because you look at, let's say, the mix in 3050. Mm -hmm. been in production for most of them, one or two years. Some weren't in production yet. So will it have a notable pilot? Mm -hmm. Not, you know, you can kind of see that and i think they on uh, the upgrades they kind of try to retcon some of that into that where they would start putting notable pilots but it was like looking at every variant of the mech from 3025 era to 3080 or something and they well isn't that. it aren't the, maybe i'm remembering wrong but aren't all the tro's written long into the future like it because in the comstar blurb in the beginning isn't like this is you know this is really written in 3150 and it's some Comstar adept doing a historical thing or, or are they? Uh, the newer ones have been done from the 2250 or whatever. But like if you read the originals, they were actually published supposedly in universe 3025, 3050, okay. 3055. And so you actually had mechs like in 3025, the infamous Banshee S wouldn't be in production for a year or two yet. Hmm. You know, um, a couple other ones at, at that time so you could see like why the only reason they had a notable pilot for it was the test pilot for that model. Yeah. Uh, and then 3050 was supposed to have been at 3050. And so there were one or two models in that that were like what was going to come up because you look, most of them were the refit kits for after the summit and all those. Right. So it was like at time of happening. And that's what I actually miss a lot from the old era and I think someone actually put a post out recently on it in one of the Facebook pages we were talking about the difference in the field now and since the jihad especially with how it felt like during the clan invasion where one we didn't have the internet in 1990 for the most part mm -hmm. so you didn't have that instant access to everything but so much was released as the source books came out we got this drib or grab we would get the battle technology magazine that would have these periphery stories in campaigns and they're on planet X facing alien invaders. Mm -hmm. All that much information, just the basic on this mech X has these guns, you know, you're facing. And that gave you the feeling of being in universe at that time. Whereas now everything is, it's 3250. I am lore master, blah, blah, blah. Here is my report. And that takes the immediacy out of it because it is looking at a historical document now. I don't think those are as immersive to the people. And I think that's seen by the fact that most people do lean towards the older books writing wise than they do towards the newer books. And especially the Jihad, where not only was it told future tense historical drafts, but doled out in ways they were doled out kind of like the old stuff, but from the future tense. And so no one could really put the picture together as what the hell happened. We're now just in this dark age. And what, you know, whereas if you're telling it historical, yeah, there'll be some rumors and misinformation maybe, but it's a historical document. It's not that unknown at this point, you know, um, whereas if they wanted to tell the jihad like the claim invasion, then sure, having it very confusing and full of misinformation intentionally would be awesome because that's what's happening. I mean, even you look at the old, um, take on the Comstar stuff. FASA understood that their quality control and editorial cleanup was so bad, it became an in-universe reference as intentional Comstar misinformation. Mm -hmm. That's why you saw the later stuff, the reports from Wolf's Dragoons, where they were intentionally fixing stuff. Or you'd see, this is the Wolf's Dragoon report, and you get the word of Blake commentary posted over theirs. The heretics think they know what's going on. <laughs> Wait till the master gets a hold of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So much more flavor to me, you know, just that stuff. And I, I honestly, I'm for flavor over 100% sterile accuracy. Yeah, definitely. 
Well, I think uh, I think there's good things on the way. You know, certainly there's a there's a lot of capital that's been infused into CGL, and there's a lot of passionate people. I think they'll do a good job kind of translating. But, uh, but have an idea. they're going to be getting a lot of mix soon. Yes, yes, a lot. <laughs> you know, because I think uh, we might have had a couple snafus here or there, like the dice, but for the most part, I think most have been pretty content with what they got in this Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It's been fun opening and uh, and fun playing. I was able to finally get onto the tabletop for the first time uh, last weekend, so it was, it was good. But uh, and COVID can't be here forever, so eventually we'll get back to our tabletops and and have some fun with it. But uh, but yeah, but I I really appreciate you taking the time to chat. This was a fun conversation, uh, Bishop. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone else enjoys our kind of uh, our geeking out together and uh, a little insight into uh, kind of creating that art. Yeah, I guess this was mostly a geek special on this one which is awesome that's fine. <laughs> I appreciate you having me on here and uh thanks yeah. Bishop. this has been fun uh, we'll catch you on the facebook page and uh and uh yeah we'll end this episode thanks for listening everyone all right sounds awesome all right thanks